This is Ship It with Justin Garrison and Autumn Nash. If you like this show, you will love the changelog. It's software news on Mondays, deep technical interviews on Wednesdays, and on Fridays, an awesome talk show for your weekend enjoyment. Find it by searching for The Changelog wherever you get your podcasts. Ship It is brought to you by Fly.io. Launch your app in five minutes or less. Learn how at fly.io. What's up, nerds? I'm here with Kurt Mackey, co-founder and CEO of Fly. You know we love Fly. So, Kurt, I want to talk to you about the magic of the cloud. (laughs) You have thoughts on this, right? Right. I think it's valuable to understand the magic behind the cloud because you can build better features for users, basically, if you understand that. You can do a lot of stuff, particularly now that people are doing LLM stuff, but you can do a lot of stuff if you get that and can be creative with it. So when you say clouds aren't magic because you're building a public cloud for developers and you go on to explain exactly how it works. What does that mean to you? In some ways it means these all came from somewhere. Like there was a simpler time before clouds where we'd get a server at Rack Shack and we'd SSH it or Telnet into it even and put files somewhere and run the web servers ourselves to serve them up to users. Clouds are not magic on top of that. They're just more complicated ways of doing those same things in a way that meets the needs of a lot of people instead of just one. One of the things I think that people miss out on, and a lot of this is actually because AWS and GCP have created such big black box abstractions. Like Lambda is really black boxy. You can't like pick apart Lambda and see how it works from the outside. You have to sort of just use what's there. But the reality is like Lambda is not all that complicated. It's just a modern way to launch little VMs and serve some requests from them and let them like kind of pause and resume and free up like physical compute time. The interesting thing about understanding how clouds work is it lets you build kind of features for your users you never would expect it. And our canonical version of this for us is that like when we looked at how we wanted to isolate user code, we decided to just expose this machines concept, which is a much lower level abstraction in Lambda that you could use to build Lambda on top of. And what machines are is just these VMs that are designed to start really fast or designed to stop and then restart really fast or designed to suspend sort of like your laptop does when it closes and resume really fast when you tell them to. And what we found is that giving people those primitives actually, there's like new apps being built that couldn't be built before, specifically because we went so low level and made such a a minimal abstraction on top of generally like Linux kernel features. A lot of our platform is actually just exposing a nice UX around Linux kernel features, which I think is, is kind of interesting. But like you still need to understand what they're doing to get the most use out of them. Very cool. Okay, so experience the magic of Fly and get told the secrets of Fly because that's what they want you to do. They want to share all the secrets behind the magic of the Fly cloud, the cloud for productive developers, the cloud for developers who ship. Learn more and get started for free at fly.io. Again, fly.io. Hello and welcome to Ship It, the podcast all about what happens after you get push. I'm your host, Justin Garrison, and with me as always is Autumn Nash. How's it going, Autumn? Good. How are you? Good. That was an unenthusiastic good. I think you're I doing know, good. No, I'm not like, <laughs> I'm only halfway through my cup of coffee. Okay. Like, stop <laughs> judging me. <laughs> I haven't even had that much sugar yet today. So we're good. <laughs> I'm, so, I thought you were not eating candy anymore, Justin. What happened? It is freaking October. Yeah, right. It's like <laughs> Halloween season. Are you kidding me? <laughs> I mean, as much as I appreciate our friendship, I had zero hope in you making it more than like a month. Like, I've never seen somebody stash candy in as many areas as you have candy stashed, okay? You have kids. You gotta hide it. I don't eat candy, though. That's your problem. <laughs> <laughs> I drink it in my coffee, okay? <laughs> I can only consume so much sugar and I save it for baked goods and coffee. Mm, baked goods. Baked goods are my favorite. Like That's a brownie. So like oh my. oh my gosh, I almost bought brownies the other day. I was like, I so wanted a brownie, and like 
but again, it's like I like I want a brownie, warm brownie with a some ice cream. On yes, top. it's just like oh my god. Okay, there's this bakery in like my like downtown area, like for where I live, and they have the most delicious, like perfect, like it's not cakey, too cakey, it's not too gooey, it's super dark. It's the most look. It's a six dollar brownie, and at first I was like, <laughs> who has a six dollar brownie? Like it's a big brownie, but at first I was like judging it, you know. As you drink your eight dollar yes! Starbucks, shut <laughs> be quiet. Okay, and then like I like took a bite and I was like I'll just take a couple bites and I was taking my kids home food look I got home and there was like this much brownie left like I like I was like I'm gonna eat it later when my kids go to bed and I'm gonna put ice no the brownie did not make it okay like I'm pretty sure I didn't even eat for the rest of the day like I just consumed the biggest brownie I've ever seen and it was like it was a life like core memory moment that's how good that brownie was nice that's good (laughs) <laughs> now I want a brownie. Now I'm gonna get a brownie. I, know, I went to Panera. I, I ordered pickup at Panera the other day, and someone stole my food, and so they made me, you know, re- remade the order and gave me two cookies. And I'm like, dang it, I didn't need this, but now I wanted it. <laughs> See, I'm not really a big cookie person. Like, I like brownie and cake. Yeah, I never was a big cookie person, and then I started making them myself, and I'm like, oh, they're you good when you make cookies make them. too. Yeah, of course I do. Who doesn't make cookies? I don't just buy like you can be, get the store bought stuff, but like making them from scratch, that's good. That's good stuff. It's so much better from scratch. I know, right? Everything. Um, so today's a today's a different episode. Uh, something that we we were doing for a long time as we started. This is like episode thirty two, I think. Something that we've been doing together. It's been great. Can you believe that we've made it thirty two episodes? I know it's funny too because it all started this like it's just been thirty two weeks, not even a whole year, but we've changed a lot. And there's been a lot of it's. I love getting all the cool people we get to talk to, all the topics, everything. and we Hopefully we've made it better. I hope so too. And I know we had some feedback for too much intro. Some people liked the outro, some people didn't. And so the thing that the idea I kind of had around it was we love the interviews. And when we give more space for the interviews, we just get to talk to the cool people longer, which is awesome. But also podcasts are great to have like what's going on and just some like general information and not have a guest all the time. So we're putting these episodes probably in maybe once a quarter or something of let's just talk about what we're autumn and I are learning, what some cool news, some things we we wanted to learn about talk about. And then if you don't like that, that's fine. You can skip it. And that's okay too. I guess just so it's an easy like trade off of like, we don't have to put this in every episode. We can kind of collect some of the, hopefully bring back some of the games. I know some people like the games. I like the games. I don't have one for today. I like when you name them absolutely ridiculous things, but. I love the, I love trying to come up with unique titles, but I was also trying, <laughs> trying really hard to do some of that. Um, so yeah, so this one is really just a couple things that Autumn and I built, not more than a couple, um, either news or topics or things that we found fairly recently that we want to talk about. Nothing is I think time box to like, you have to know about it at this time. Um, I think this episode is going to go out. Wait, one, two. Oh, it's going to go out after the U S election. Um, so nothing that's again, really critical. We can talk about these articles. We'll put them all in the show notes. You can go read them if you want to read more about them, but it's not like something that's like, Oh, you need this information now. It's we I found this interesting. Autumn found it interesting over the last month or two and we want to share it. I'm kind of sad with all the ridiculousness and like tech that we didn't do it when it was close to all the like craziness happening. But maybe this way you're not just hearing the same stuff over and over again. I mean, yeah, like also like delaying it a little bit is like, hey, maybe maybe you we can see after the hype cycle uh, how things are different. (laughs) That's true. Uh, Which actually like one of my first articles um, isn't again, it's not news, but it is kind of in the, the hype cycle of it was posted in. October. But in Australia, a lot of companies are going back to work. And I guess there was some problems with trains recently. And there was videos of just like these insane lines for buses for people to try to get into work. And I was just like, well, yeah, like this is what happens when like traffic happens and everything else. And the thing that made me want to share this was just the amount of privilege the leaders that like had quotes in this article where they literally say... It's an excuse. Again, this is a quote from leader at the company saying you have to come back to the office. This is not Justin's opinion. This is a quote. No, this is like I like fell out of my chair when I was like, okay, really? Uh, It's an excuse or a reason to push back. No matter where you are, there's things always going to be. There's always going to be issues with traffic. It's just life. I'm like, well, actually, we didn't have to deal with that. How did we get here? Like, I just we went from remote work and this great economy and like. I mean, I guess in a way we know how we got here, but like, did we just forget that you need people to work in your 
business it? Like, where's the disconnect to like reality? Because one side has so much money and so much privilege <laughs> that they don't know what regular people's lives are like anymore. Yeah. And the other side is just miserable. Do you know, like, the people that I just everybody is miserable and hates their jobs right now. Like this second, this second quote is the one that I'm like, I this is ridiculous. They say, if they feel like it's not productive, live closer. And I'm like, that's not people's realities. I was told that at work one day, somebody was like, you should just live closer to the city. And I was like, that city that has gone up like quadruple the price. Yeah. In the last three years, I just, I should magically, like, I also think people don't really remember that there is a difference between people who've been in tech for five to 10 years and people who've been in tech for 20 years. And people that have owned a house for five to 10 years, you know, versus 20 years. (laughs) Well, I was reading an article and it was like saying that there is the upper middle class and then there's people that are below the poverty line, right? And then you've got this new weird like division of the middle class, right? And you've got like they were dividing it and they were basically saying middle class people who bought a house like 10 years ago and that don't have little kids in any like form of daycare or after school program are living completely different lives than people that are paying for daycare because they were looking at like they were comparing the price of like mortgages like now and the price of like daycares. And like you could live in the same neighborhood, be making the same amount of money and living two completely different yeah, lifestyles. I don't know when you bought it. Yes. But not just that, but it was like, I have a friend and me, we were talking about uh, daycare bills and I was saying like to put my kid in the daycare in my building would have cost $2,800. A month? Yes. For a four-year-old, for one kid, right? And I was like, who can afford this? And they were like, that's my mortgage. And I'm like, I wish that was my mortgage. You know what I mean? So it just shows you like same job, same state. You know what I mean? Like, and it's just wild. Like- the difference between he can pay for daycare at the, it, it was the most expensive daycare. He could have paid for the daycare and his mortgage for the price of what I'm just paying for a mortgage and I'm supposed to pay for the daycare on top. Of, you know what I mean? Yeah. That's wild. It is just, yeah. It's not even like you're not getting better service. You're not getting like anything that's like different from. Nobody like, even likes going to daycare. Your kid's going <laughs> to scream the whole time. They're going to get sick and not go half of the, you know what I mean? Like you're doing. I tell you, I used to run a daycare. Well, no, you didn't. I ran a summer camp daycare uh, for, for my school for two years. Um, I was like, it was elementary school and it was just like, yeah, I, I was like the finance person and like I did all the marketing planning for it. It was, it was a really interesting time. <laughs> Were you a camp leader? Like it was at the school. Like it was just like we like rented space from the school and like and then we we worked out the funding to like, hey, how much do they need to pay us? You did help to desk and then you did that? No, this was like I guess yeah, was, I was like it was a summer job because I was doing uh, I did that like after high school for two years in summer. And then I started doing construction um after in summer jobs. So it's like I I've had all how are you not a camp counselor? Because my kids are obsessed with you. And if I that, I totally thought we were about to have like a daddy daycare, like total Justin, like just doing ridiculous Justin things with like a trail of little duckling children behind you. I probably I probably would have been like a like a proper camp counselor out in the woods. Like I could see myself doing that. So. Proper? I don't know. I mean, like, like proper. Like, yes. Like proper, like at a proper camp, like not like renting some space at a at a school. My kids are literally obsessed with you, like obsessed. Because they see me on the screen all the time. Probably- they think that you're like their bestie, and I'm like, he's my friend. Well, Back off. I bought them ice cream, so you did buy them ice cream. And you bought them cool badges. And then I felt like I was just the third wheel of you hanging out with my kids. Like, <laughs> like, like I don't even know. Like, I was like, am I allowed to be here? Like, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I can't wait to see them again at scale. It's going to be fun. Oh, my God. That's going to be like, okay, hey, bye, That's mom. Okay, right bye. Yeah. Like, <laughs> you have to. T- oh, we should talk about scale CFPs, too. Well, so by the time this episode goes out, the scale CFP is going to be closed. Oh, okay. um, so people, it, it doesn't matter if you want to submit one. I mean, you can check the website. Sometimes it gets extended, but I, I think we're closing it on November 1st. Um, there are you know other conferences that you could submit to, but it, scale is still open for registrations. Come, it's in March next year in Pasadena. It's so much fun. Yeah, so it's a it's a great uh, environment to be in. To if especially if you're networking or you want to learn some really obscure weird things, uh, Pasadena is like a really cool 
like overlap between like Hollywood and JPL. It is and, so weird. Yeah. So that's a lot of fun. We saw America's Best Dance or whatever. What is it? America's Most Talent walking across. The- yeah. America's Got Talents. Yeah. Um, what's her name? Was walking across the street while we were like walking yeah. down the. <laughs> I tried to get Justin to take a picture with the chicken with me. And he's like, I'm from California. I see this all the time. <laughs> <laughs> this isn't unique. <laughs> yeah. So anyway. I'll actually share my first article that I wanted to at least talk a little bit about, which I thought was. Were there any other good quotes? Oh, those are the two that like I was just I had to share. So I, the the links again will be in the show notes. Um, you can read if you want. Again, I thought it was interesting that this was about Australia, and I didn't know anything about Australia's return to office policies or how it's affecting them. Um, so it was nice to see something that like isn't just California or West Coast United States yeah. problem. This is like ah no, this is people hate it everywhere. It's Do you wonder if the guy that made the WebMD video was like, see, they're on my side. <laughs> <laughs> like- Oh, that video. That's a deep cut. It was so bad. <laughs> like, like, you know, he's so happy somewhere. Like, someone's taking the heat off of me. <laughs> I think everyone forgot about that. You're the only one over here. Like, oh, no. oh, no, forever. <laughs> like, I just, I watched it and, like, my mouth was on the ground. I was like, they, somebody came up with the idea. They scripted this, yeah. saw the end project, and they still did it. Like, you know, <laughs> like, it wasn't a small project. Like, you went there. Chances yes! to say no. It was so many chances to be like, this is a horrible idea. We should not do this. And they still did it. Like, yeah. wow. Uh, so the other article, um, Pragmatic Engineer, if you follow him. Oh, I love that guy. Great newsletter. Has a, a lot of like in-depth articles. One of the things that like I love is how how in-depth it goes. One of the things I hate is how long the articles are <laughs> to like get the information. I'm like, I like this is great reporting. I didn't want to read a book every week. But this article I'm actually quoted in, which was about uh, why techies are leaving big tech. You've been quoted in a lot of things lately and I've been chuckling because the, <laughs> as the mass exodus happens, everybody keeps dropping your blog as it happens. We're not going to mention any names, but like as the exodus just keeps going and i'm just like i remember when you said you were gonna write that blog and i was like i was scared for you (laughs) and then you did it and now it's being quoted everywhere and like you would have thought a year later things would be getting better and it is wild yeah and this is like for me it's one of the important things of when i feel something is important to write it down publicly on my blog is like actually an important thing of like my process because there's so many things that like i've referenced back that were like more than a year old Mm -hmm. and this is one of those things that i wrote it december of last year and and i literally someone from bloomberg called me last week it was like hey that article you wrote i'm like dude this is like 10 months old they're like yeah no it's still happening like we still have we still have questions but honestly though like i think a year ago, if you had asked either, any of us or people that we know, would things still be this way? Like they've gotten progressively worse. They're not even better, but they're they're not just not better. They're worse. They're yeah. so much worse. I could have never have guessed. Would you have guessed? Like if somebody said, hey, like they were going to be doing five day RTO and all these things, would do you think? Oh, yeah, that I saw coming. Like that was okay. like an obvious one. <laughs> like like this is like a part time RTO. Like, no, this is going the like they already had returned to team. So, like this is Amazon specific. The article here from Pragmatic Engineer is actually I liked it because it went into a lot of other big tech companies where it's like. Well, I just met in general because it's yeah. not just like. Amazon, but like in general, do you think you would have saw the market and like the way that employees are being treated and just kind of like where tech is going? Do you feel like a year ago you could have guessed we'd be here now? No, not this dire. Yeah. Um, Because, because partially because of like the hype cycle of AI stuff that's like taking over the jobs, partially because overlap, at least in the United States, from like the election Mm -hmm. trauma and things that are happening. And then the other third thing of just like, well, now you have to drive to an office and like live closer sort of mentality Mm -hmm. of like, it's your fault. All of those things combined, like no way. It's what okay. Talk more about your article, but I do have follow up questions about the election. Well, I, like I mean, the article I thought was really good uh, that he laid out like seven main things that he found that people were leaving big tech for, and in in many cases, like he's specifically calling out people that went to small companies or startups or starting their own startups. I was one of those people that in January I left Amazon. I went to a startup. This is my first startup I've ever been to. It's really different. <laughs> it's like I've only ever worked in really old companies or really large companies. And and being at a startup is so different. And for me, not in a burnout sort of like I work too much way because I've always had those boundaries that I, I feel like I'm pretty good at. Uh, and the company has been 
good at supporting me in those things. Like I've never been happier in my career than the past 10 months. It is good to say that you are coming from a place of privilege because you have had such a successful career. But yes, absolutely. I mean, it is wild. Who would have thought that startups would be like I, everybody I know who's left big tech has gone to a startup and they are immensely happy. Like last week we had Pete on and Pete went from AWS and then to two startups. Like, yeah. so it's just crazy. Like big tech was known for stability and you go there and like, that's like the goal, you know? And now people are going to startups. Like who would have thought? Yeah. And I mean, some of that, like that's literally like the first point in this article is like big tech's not stable. Like it's just not, it's just like, not only are you just scared of the layoffs or, or giant reorgs that you have to do some new AI thing, or you have no agency over your work. And that's just not something that people want to deal with. They're like, actually, I'll give up some of that stability for having more impact or having just enjoying the thing I'm doing a little bit more. I think when you get deeply technical people, they want to work on something they're passionate about and they do better work when they do that. So the fact that people are being forced to work on all these projects that they don't necessarily believe in or they feel are like yucky, I think the people that are going to leave are not going to be the people that are bad at their jobs or that have options. It's always going to be the people that are good and they have options and they can go somewhere better. Yeah. So I didn't want to, we don't go too deep into the article. I will say that like, you know, I was, I was quoting it from that blog post, but I think he did a good job in here just like identifying like the top seven things of just like, this was, these are why people have been leaving and this is why it's been difficult. Is there anything that surprised you? I think there's the one point of like steep compensation drops where like that was always kind of the like guarantee, like you go to big tech because you get the big paycheck and then it's guaranteed forever. Right. And, and that's not the case because people aren't getting more stock options or the stock isn't doing as well as they were promised. And in both those cases, when you're, when your compensation is tied a lot to the stock price, then that impacts actually what you make. It's different. Like when I was at Disney, I did get some stock options, but it wasn't a lot. It wasn't like half my pay or anything. It was, I, I want to say it was like $8,000 or something like that a year for stock options. Our bonuses came from the movies. So what, however the movie did at the box office, at least in animation, they would give us a bonus based on how it did. And it was so, that was like so out of my control that it felt like just like it wasn't even like a stock like I can't Im influence a stock price any more than I can influence a box office but the fact that it all came and we had no guarantees of any of it like the stock I could at least hold on to for longer mm -hmm. right? I'm like oh this maybe this will turn around and then, and I'll I'll get something out of it later like the box office bonuses were bizarre because it was just like oh you know what like uh, Record Ralph 2 didn't do so good so you don't get a big bonus I'm like, oh, that's that stinks. Were you taxed the same way? It was still taxed as like a as a compens is regular compensation, but it's like a big you know drop. But also, one year when I was there, we didn't have any movies come out because they canceled a, a movie called Gigantic that never came out, and a movie got pushed back. And so it's like, wow, I had a whole year where I got no bonus. I'm like, I get no guarantees. Do you get to see the ones that never come out? They're not. I mean, if they're not finished, no. Um, there are movies that weren't released or aren't e like easily available that I could see internally. Oh. <laughs> in your opinion, you've been in tech for like 20 years, right? Just call me old. That's fine. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't say that. I was. <laughs> I like it. I was you can just, keep going. Okay. okay. <laughs> so how does big tech continue to innovate and to get the best talent the way that they are treating their employees? Like how long do you think that they can just go off, like lead, buy it. lead with I mean, fear? They, they, and I mean, but they're not buying it. Look at what you just said. The stock. Like, oh no, they're buying startups, right? Like the, um, cause the thing, like a lot of the, the new innovation from any big tech that I've seen uh, in, I don't know, at least the last 10 years has been from acquisitions, acqui hires, right? They're like, oh, this startup had a cool thing. We bought them and now we we own that thing. And and that's literally the like goal for most of the startups too, right? Because the startups are like, great, I was a founder. You just bought me for, you know, a hundred million dollars. Cool. I can retire after I get this comp payout in four years. But we also don't have 0% interest rates anymore though. No, but I mean, like if you you know, a company bought for say a hundred million dollars of 20 people and the founders own most of that. Like that's still like, I'm oh, good. I'm just, I'm going to sell. Right. Like someone comes to me, like, I'm going to give you enough money to retire. They don't have as much money to fall to throw around though. But I don't know. Like they almost acquired Woods for all that money. So who knows? I mean, Apple has just like 
sacks of cash somewhere. I mean, there's <laughs> Apple does. I don't know if they're all that liquid, but true. Yeah. I mean, Apple probably has the most liquid, but yeah, a lot of them still have plenty of cash to buy a startup of like, oh, this will improve our business or give us some innovation or whatever. Right. They're, most of them, most of the ones I see are just infusion of new products from outside resources. Do you think that tech can continue the like the big tech can continue to live off of the fear cycle and still do well? Or like, do you think that you see this changing soon? I mean, I, I think big, at least some of big tech is scared of being broken up, right? Like Google lost a lawsuit recently and they're at, like, literally they were called a monopoly on the ruling that like you have a monopoly in search. You shouldn't have this. We will figure out what your punishment is later. And, and that is like a constant fear for a lot. Like there's so many lawsuits right now, of like smaller companies going after them. And a lot of big tech is losing some of these as like, we own so much of the stack that we shouldn't like actually the judges are saying you should have more competition. And so if things like AWS split from Amazon or Azure split from Microsoft or even, you know, GCP from Google, right? Like th those would be like, oh, what's going on here? <laughs> Maybe not in Google's case, but in a lot of the cases, like that would actually be impactful to the business because it makes a lot of money and it drives a lot of new business. And like, actually, how do we do this other thing now if we don't have that cash cow coming in of free money because we own so much of the stack? So I think that is going to change. And I'm I'm actually a little hopeful for competition in those regards, but I don't think that's quick. If it's not broken down by monopoly, do you think that we just continue to trend this way with fears of layoff constantly and just them losing the talent that can leave? Uh, no, I think they'll start outsourcing. I think they'll just say, oh, actually, it's just too expensive to get people here. We're just going to open a bunch of offices in India where people, we can pay them half the price and have them forced in, to come to an office. And and just like, oh, we just can own more. Like it's, it's just fear in a different place in a lot of ways. And it's just like, actually, we can just outsource this somewhere else and we get the same quote unquote quality, right? The same output of <laughs> something. What does that mean for U.S. tech workers, though? Or is this just like how it goes now? That one, I mean, I I don't know. If if we can't compete, if you can't compete in small businesses with the big companies, then you just can't get the money to pay people to come join you. And, and granted, there are plenty of like, I'm having more fun uh, than I've had for a long time. So it's like I I really enjoy this, but I also have a family, and I also have a mortgage, and I also have you know things that I have to pay for. So it's just like how much how much can I give up to have fun? <laughs> yeah that's that's not something that is sustainable and i i think that there is always going to be this like large company has all the money sort of mindset that makes sense share one of your articles we I, we've already been going for like almost 30 minutes we've <laughs> done an article and a half all my articles kind of relate because i'm getting ready for github universe which will happen before this comes out but i was just doing some research on different like just kind of trying to learn like what we're seeing from ai models so far, you know, like are, what is it looking at like as far as like bias? Because um, my talk is about empowering women in data to try to combat um, AI bi bias and basically trying to create a better future for AI because of uh, having more diversity. Now, what do you mean by empowering women? We are in this very weird place where a lot of people are diversity is... I mean, DEI is didn't earn it. And it's this very negative like connotations for diversity. And we've really got like for a few years during COVID, I think we were really pushing diversity and it was seeming like tech was getting better for women and people of color. And now that there's less money and hiring is harder, I think it's harder for everybody, but I think it's getting especially harder to get people from diverse backgrounds into tech. But getting them into tech isn't empowering them, right? I mean, like it, it is life changing for many of them. But I think the way that you get people, like the way that you have an option and that you allow people to bring the qualities that they have that may be not like traditional tech, but you're bringing like those, that background. And then, like, for instance, like apprenticeships, I feel are very much empowering women because a lot of times you're teaching a skill, but you're also using the skills that they already have. And most apprenticeships were paid, right? I don't know about how we're going to go forward, but most, especially women, when you're, we're majority caretakers, 
for society, when you can pay them to do an apprenticeship to learn, it gives them childcare options and it gives them options to be able to afford the gas, the lunch the, or whatever, or even the computer or, you know, whatever they need to reach that new level. So I think a lot of programs like just giving people the possibilities and not just that, but we've just done a terrible job at like at retaining people. So it is a lot of empowering and like having a safe, conducive environments to be able to grow in and how we make those environments welcoming to everybody. And how are we making them where people can thrive if you're not the same as everybody else? Like when you're a mom, it's very different when you say you have to go pick up your kids versus a dad. And the demands on the primary parent, like there is a Nobel Prize economist who had said that the greatest indication of how we will close the wage gap is having a supportive partner because women and primary caregivers who are, I mean, women are 95% of primary caregivers. They were constantly forced to take the less greedy jobs. So she, she determined that greedy jobs are the jobs that pay more and are more they take more time and they take more resources, right? And they, and they might require you to move. Yes, right? they might require yes. life so like changes. life changes. Like it's yeah, like yeah. you're so th- basically the job in your family that you put all of your life decisions on those greedy jobs because they pay more, right? But women are constantly having to take the less greedy jobs. So even if she has the same skill, the same years in and all of that, she's going to ch- pick that less greedy job because she needs the flexibility to be a caretaker. And they did a bunch of studies showing like who's doing like a majority of the household work and everything. And it was still women, right? So that's another reason why if you know you have to cook, clean and do all these things and then pick, do pick up, you need the less greedy job, right? So this just kind of goes to the fact of like, how are we empowering women and making sure that not only are they getting into tech, but they're staying in tech and that we're making a conducive environment because what prices are we going to pay? What's up, friends? I'm here with Dave Rosenthal, CTO of Century. So Dave, when I look at Century, I see you driving towards full application health, error monitoring where things began, session replay, being able to replay a view of the interface a user had going on when they experienced an issue with full tracing, full data, the advancements you're making with tracing and profiling, cron monitoring, code coverage, user feedback, and just tons of integrations. Give me a glimpse into the inevitable future. What are you driving towards? Yeah, one of the things that we're seeing is that in the past, people had separate systems where they had like logs on servers, written files. They were maybe sending some metrics to Datadog or something like that or some other system. They were monitoring for errors with some product, maybe it was Sentry. But more and more what we see is people want all of these sources of telemetry logically tied together somehow. And uh, that's really what we're pursuing at Sentry now. We have this concept of a trace ID, which is kind of a key that ties together all of the pieces of data that are associated with the user action. So if user loads a web page, we want to tie together all the server requests that happened, any errors that happened, any metrics that were collected. And what that allows on the back end, you don't just have to look at like three different graphs and sort of line them up in time and you know try to draw your own conclusions. You can actually like analyze and slice and dice the data and say, hey, what did this metric look like for people with this operating system versus this metric look like for people with this operating system and actually get into those details. So this kind of idea of tying all of the telemetry data together using this concept of a trace ID or basically some key, I think is a, is a big win for developers trying to diagnose and debug real world systems and something that is, uh, we're kind of charge the path for that for everybody. Okay. Let's see you get there. Let's see you get there tomorrow. Yeah. Perfectly. How will systems be different? How will teams be different? As a result. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess, again, <laughs> I'll just keep saying it maybe, but I think it kind of goes back to this debugability experience. When you are digging into an issue, you know, having a, a sort of a richer data model that's, you know, your logs are structured. They're sort of this hierarchical structure with spans. And not only is it just the spans that are structured, they're tied to errors, they're tied to other things. So when you have the data model that's kind of interconnected, it opens up all different kinds of analysis that were just kind of either very manual before, kind of guessing that maybe this log was, you know, happened at the same time as this other thing, or were just impossible. We get excited not only about the new kinds of 
issues that we can detect with that interconnected data model, but also just for every issue that we do detect, how easy it is to get to the bottom of it. I love it. Okay, so they mean it when they say code breaks, fix it faster with Sentry. More than 100,000 growing teams use Sentry to find problems fast, and you can too. Learn more at Sentry.io. That's S-E-N-T-R-Y dot I-O. And use our code CHANGELOG. Get $100 off the team plan. That's almost four months free for you to try out Sentry. Once again, Sentry.io. There's an article called The Urgent Need for Bias uh, Mitigation in Large Language Models, and it compares the different large language models. So it's comparing um, Claude OpenAI, which is GPT, Claude, uh, and just comparing it different, each version of it, and then showing the bias and kind of talking about what biases were found as far as health, race, gender, and religion. And just it gets into a lot of the data. And if you put bad in, you get bad out, right? But because the models are also learning and they're making these connections based off the data, the bias will also grow, right? Because you're, it's making these connections. If there's one thing I learned from reading the Llama three paper is like training is all about bias. Exactly. Like every train that all is, that's all training is, is adding the, the preferred bias for whoever's doing the training. Thank you. See, that's what I was trying to get at, and I couldn't find the right words. Like that was amazing. It's just, it's just like, oh, you're just, you're just biasing the model. That's the whole point. So, because we're humans, right, and we all have a certain level of bias, but the people that predominantly are in tech are usually male, and they usually have very certain backgrounds, right? So, we're what a lot of what we're putting into is already biased. But to your statement, it's almost taking bias and then multiplying it. Well, and like bias is good things for some things, right? Because like I yeah. have, I have a bias that the LLM should produce a coherent sentence, Mm -hmm. right? Because otherwise it could just be random words. And like, I want the bias to be like, I want to be able to understand what it's saying. You have a bias for Dr. Pepper. Oh man. (laughs) Uh, But yeah, like like that bias exists and it's there for a reason. But like at some point you don't realize the, the unintentional bias, the training that you put in by saying like, Hey, the order of the words in the sentence, the bias that you picked might influence if this was me as a white dude saying the sentence versus someone with a different background or a different gender or a different nationality trying to say the same thing. And that bias comes through in unintentional ways sometimes, but it's very obvious when it's like, this is foreign to me as an outsider of this world. And if, if you're not used to how the LLM speaks or what it gives you for data, you're like, actually, this seems weird because I didn't grow up this way. And the bias is not the same bias that I have. Not just that, but it can be culturally, right? Like you could both yeah. be the same race, but it could be a different culture. Uh, I was in a presentation for uh, our apprenticeships and one of our coworkers was disciplined for saying, I'm going to throw it back to Laura. And that to me, I was like, why are we... Why? Like, I, I had no idea what we were talking about, but apparently that there was a, one of the um, chairs on the like committee or whatever thought that there was like a, I guess it was a derogatory term in like the UK maybe. Um, so it was just crazy because we weren't even aware of that being a negative thing because we weren't, we didn't grow up in that culture, but then you get to tech, which is a global community and you have to make sure that you're not saying things that are like a negative connotation in like other cultures. But my two other articles kind of go with that. Um, There's one about the Palo Alto uh, police force and they are using something called uh, draft one, which is based off of GPT. And it is basically they're using their cameras and talk to text basically to come up with police reports, which is seems to be a huge time saver. And because staffing is down, I do understand how, I mean, I think we're all using chat GPT as time savers, right? But when it's somebody's life and how these reports are used in court and can, you know, they can- Yeah, the impact is so much more yes. than- I'm writing my Halloween decoration code with mostly like, I'm like, how much of this could chat GPT actually write for exactly. me? But like the, the stakes for that are none, right? Like this is just it, like an experiment. Exactly. So it's not that at all I am saying I'm against it because I use chat GPT every day, you know, like I am very much, if it, if it can make your life easier, 
do it, but when it to a com- degree, exactly, right? like to that, depending on that risk. Yes, but when it comes to the fact that we are doing things that we know are are disproportionately hurting certain groups of people, like people of color are already disproportionately affected by false acquisitions and not not having the same socioeconomic background to be able to defend themselves in court. And the fact that police reports are so important to what happens in court and like your sentencing and the fact that this is now becoming so widely used, it's really scary because of the biases we're already finding. And these reports are going to be taken as, you know, as the source of truth. And then what? And then that kind of goes back yeah. also. Oh. And because and people make assumptions about that as data, they're like, well, this was data. This isn't bias. It's just data. I'm like, no, 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 that's not how this works. <laughs> that's like the Wells Fargo algorithm. Were they trying to be harmful? No, but they look like there's cause. Was it, uh, what's the saying with the causation? You can have data and it could be honest data, but why is the data that way? So it got to a point where it wasn't lending money. Like the algorithm was not recommending uh, people of color and women and people of like different backgrounds to be recommended for loans, for mortgages. And it was because people of color were at average making less when the data was trained. So they were making less and they had more like credit issues or different things, but it was judging like an entire group of people off of that data. Was that data taken in correctly? Maybe, but why is that bias there? Is it because more people of color were facing other socioeconomic like issues, you know? So it was like- And I I love like the options on the table to like just not do some of this stuff too, right? Like all these rules we put in place, we put in there. My favorite example is uh, last year, 2023, state of California got rid of jaywalking laws. They're like, actually, we just don't like, we're not going to ticket anyone for jaywalking anymore. And I like, I grew up in California, like jaywalking has always been like, don't cross ever in these places. And, and it was just like, that was like a big thing. And like last year, I'm like, why did they get rid of it? Like, why is jaywalking not a thing anymore? It's like, isn't it dangerous still? Don't all the bad things still apply? And they found that over 30% of jaywalking tickets were for black people in an area that only 9% of the population was black. That's wild. And they're like, this is disproportionately against certain people that are getting these tickets. Does that mean that they're the only ones jaywalking? Absolutely not. But they're the ones that were being targeted for the tickets and saying like, this is the law that affects you. So we're just going to get rid of the law. Actually, like, this doesn't matter. We, there was a, a press conference in Louisiana a few years back and they were talking about the possibility of getting rid of fees for like tickets and things. And they were like, how do you feel about no longer – they weren't going to get rid of the fees, but they were going to get rid of the jail like sentences because they were saying like so many people had these nonviolent crime, like very nonviolent, like uh, just tickets, you know, like stupid tickets. But they were compounding so much because people were so poor, they weren't able to pay their you tickets. Pay the fee, yeah. yeah. So they were getting so so many people were getting in prison because of their fees, but then they were losing their jobs because yeah. they were sent to prison. So you have created this cycle. And they asked, I think, a warden of the prison. And he goes, well, who will wash our cars? They were talking about people. Like he was cool to basically enslave people because of a $20 parking fee or just stupid fees like or stupid tickets yeah. because he wanted them to wash their cars. He was worried about their job. <laughs> I was like, what? Uh, like, it was just wild. So it just, it's, I think that there's a lot of cool things that we can do, but it's very scary to see how we are going to like societally impact and oppress like the same people who have been going through this over and over and over again. And we're putting like, let's go put it into things that are make our lives more efficient and easier, but let's not trust it to do these things that we already as humans have a hard time doing, you know, <laughs> what's your next link? I'm going to piggyback a little bit. I'm not going to talk about the link because I haven't read it yet, okay. but Apple released a white paper about LLMs Ooh. that I've just, the premise of it, I found fascinating uh, because they're saying that basically like LLMs are like, they, they aren't good. They aren't good for very specific things. And the quote in here, again, I haven't read this white paper yet, so I don't really want to talk about it in depth, but the quote was, LLMs cannot perform genuine logical reasoning. They replicate reasoning steps from their training data. This is the part that I'm still trying to learn about, which is really confusing to me because they're math. 
right? Majority of like LLMs is like a lot of math behind the scenes. Well, it's math in, for the fact that it tokenizes everything. It makes everything math because computers only do math. Mm -hmm. Like it doesn't know a word. Mm -hmm. It knows ASCII characters. And so it, it turns everything into numbers so that it can do math because otherwise computers can't do anything. <laughs> it was weird. I watched a video and it was saying to ask chat GPT how to spell strawberries. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and it can't spell strawberries. How many, R, how many R's are in strawberries? Oh, how many R's are in yeah, strawberries. Yeah. But it can if you separate them because of the way that it tokenizes. So it's like yep. wild because we haven't found all the edge cases of how it doesn't know, understand data. So like there's so many things like what if it doesn't understand what we're asking for more serious questions? Well, and this is why like there's so many jailbreaks. Like the yes. jailbreaks are just like so easy because there's like actually if you do add a space between every character, the LLM's like, well, yeah, I got the numbers. I know what the what the math adds up to. But like the thing you put into the model was completely incoherent to what a human would see. Right. And like the model's like, oh, this is the math. Okay, here's your output. And yeah, that, that stuff is just kind of rampant. So I haven't read the paper yet. I do want to talk about it later. Whenever I've, I finally, I might read it on my way to all things open, but the, a long form thing that I did read recently was called platform strategy by Gregor hope. I think it's, hope, I don't know. Fantastic book. If you're a platform engineer, if you're doing platform stuff, this book had some of the most complete like business applications to what a platform actually does for a company and, or doesn't do for a company that I've read so far. And so it is, it's a, lean pub book, like you pay what you want kind of thing. Like you go pay for it. I want to read his other books now after reading this one. Cause I was like, this was fantastic. And I wish I would have bought the pack. I think he has like a three pack of like cloud strategy, software engineer, something and, and platform strategy. But I found it took me a little while to read cause I was reading it in bits and pieces. And I think it's like, I don't know, it's over 300 pages, which I'm just a slow reader. Uh, so it took me a little while, but I, I had it all marked down. I was reading it on my iPad and marking it up. It was a really good book. I love when No Scratch does that. No Scratch Press when they do the bundles. Yeah, I love that. Another white paper. It like Blue Sky is having a moment, uh, and it's been a lot of fun. <laughs> it is, and I'm so excited about it. It's been a lot of fun in the last week. We're recording this on October 24th, so you're all going to read this a little later. But there's been an influx of just people and information and stuff going on on Blue Sky recently that has been fun as like someone I've been there for a little over a year now. And it's been quiet, but I've still been enjoying like the architecture of it and how people are integrating the app protocol, that sort of stuff. Um, I wanted to reshare the white paper from that protocol in Blue Sky because I did read this a while ago. It got updated in October. Uh, I haven't read it yet, but like they they tripled the number of authors on it because the one I have a copy of, I was like, oh, I had three authors before. Now there's nine. Like what's going on? So I haven't reread it, but I, I think most of the content's the same. I want a diff for white papers. That would be great. I wonder if you could put it into like get into <laughs> well, and like like Google has the uh, AI podcast mm -hmm. thing. Um, that like I thought about, oh, I wonder, I've already read this paper. I wonder what the podcast version it would be like, uh, but I haven't, I, I want to, I want to read that one again, but I'm going to share it in the notes because if you, if you're not on Blue Sky right now, it's, it's just, it's having a moment in social networks right now where people finally got fed up with X enough after blocking and AI training on art. And I hope this is the end and we've all picked <laughs> one place and we can just go there and I can delete my X account. Like I will be so excited because going back and forth between three different social medias is so, that is just, that's too much work. Yeah. Welcome to Deverell. Um. <laughs> <laughs> and I just, but it makes me feel bad. Like, okay. So I, had got uh, another Twitter because we were going to do like a startup thing at one point. And I had got another Twitter to just, you know, lock the name down. And the unhinged right wing stuff that this Twitter who doesn't follow anything. Oh, yeah. It doesn't. It has no followers. I've never liked anything from it. And it gets the most for one. It gets so many like notifications for Elon. It's wild. Yeah. It doesn't follow him, but it's constantly being, being fed these notifications. And like, I look down and I'm like, why is this on my phone? And then not on, <laughs> on top of that, it is the most unhinged, just. Hatred drives engagement, right? Like that's the best. It is just, it's not even like the mainstream. It's like, it's being fed. You know <laughs> you what I, all, the, all the corners right off the bat. It's just being fed the most from a dark hole under a rock stuff that you have ever seen. And I'm like, this isn't even a popular tweet. 
Like it's not, it's not feeding me what's mm. popular. It's not feeding yeah. me the mainstream. It is feeding just straight unhinged right wing conspiracy theories. Yeah. And I'm like, like, what is the algorithm you've been looking for? Because I've given you no indication of this is what I want. I log in. The only reason I log into X right now is because I manage the work, my work accounts. And, and again, it's like it, it follows the employees from the company who most of them are not active uh, on X. But yeah, it's the same kind of thing where I'm just like, what is going on here? Like, oh, I'm in the wrong account. But it's weird because my X account doesn't see any of this stuff. Well, I don't, I'll take that back. It's seen some weird stuff that I don't follow, but it's just. It's so different. Like it is like, you know, how when we hear that, like, oh, there's like all this gross stuff and you're like, oh, where? I just see my friends like and then every now and then you see some unhinged stuff. But you're like, uh, it's it's not great. And I don't see as much as the stuff that I want to see before. And now that I get those notifications, I'm just like, has this stuff like has it always been this bad? Because it is so bad. Like in the closer to the election, it's gotten just wow. I think that's. TikTok is that also to the extreme, right? Because like your it for is. you page is your for you page, like no one else. Like, and, and there are some like popular things that bubble up, but like it's even more so. But I am really curious about the personalized moderation tools that Blue Sky has put in place because you can you can subscribe to block lists, you can have all these other controls where you don't see stuff that someone else does on the same network, and so like the Blue Sky moderation becomes very personal. Uh, even more so than like Mastodon, which is like on a server basis, right? Like a server is going to block a bunch of other servers. Like we don't want the all the bad stuff from those other servers, but like you're still like in a community that's server based moderation. Blue Sky and, and algorithmic feeds like TikTok are very personal, and it's only you that's getting that exact feed uh, in that way. And even like again, like Blue Sky, like everyone's like, oh, there's there's so much art and there's so much uh, art they don't want to see. There's a lot of things that people are like, I opened Blue Sky and all I saw was furries. And I'm just like, oh, like that's some moderation that probably like I've been there for long enough now. And some of it might might have been defaulted from when I came before that I don't see you know now. But like there's just controls in there that are like, oh, I've never seen these controls on any social network where I'm just like, oh, yeah, don't don't show me any nudity. I don't want to see it. It's fine. There's a beans filter because Barry harassed them <laughs> yeah. for so long that they made a beans filter. Y'all, you can filter baked beans. It, so like the custom feeds is another one where it's like you can add labels to all this stuff. I have one that I, a labeler I subscribe to for pronouns. Fantastic. You don't even have to you don't have to say it in your profile or anything, but it adds a little like what is this person's pronouns mm -hmm. directly under their name, which is just part of the labeler. And I'm like, cool. I don't have to do any of that work. They don't have to tell me. They don't have to put it so like it just picks it up from their their posts of what their pronouns are. I'm like, that's really cool. I love that I can have a different feed for each part of my personality. Like I have books guy, then I have <laughs> like text guy, then I have like for databases, DevOps. Like it's just everybody's compartmentalized into where I want it. Speaking of which, if people are getting started and want to join, I have a couple starter packs. Um, I have one for cloud native people and I have one for all things open speakers, which I was like, oh, how does this work for conferences? Autumn, you started a couple, right? I've got Linux and uh, GitHub Universe. And then there's a database one named by, um, ran by someone named, I think, Josh. There's a couple cool ones. Yeah, we'll put those links in too. Because again, if like people are coming to Blue Sky, I think starter packs is a cool idea because it's not a starter pack that's pushed on you from the network. We're usually like, if you join X today, it's like, well, do you want to follow Elon? Do you want to follow like these handful of people, really, really popular people versus do you want to follow people that talk about this topic or are interested in this thing along with you? It's like, you know, when you, you know, when your friend, like, you know, your friend is always post the best food pictures on Instagram and then you ask them for a taco like place recommendation, but you feel like you can trust them. Like it's people in those communities making starter packs. So it's like, not a corporation pushing it on you or pushing like the people that they hired to be in this community, but it's like you're the other community members showcasing who they are interested in following. And I really like that aspect. I think like blue sky is being very, the growth is from the community. It's from people and it's getting back to the part that we really enjoyed about Twitter. Like the people in the community that was there, that was the cool part of Twitter. It wasn't Twitter. You know, so I think if we can get everybody in one place, this is what we've been looking for for so long. It's not perfect, right? There's there's oh, no. still fear that like this is they just raised 
I just saw an announcements today. They raised a round of funding, like $15 million. So it's like, they still have profit. They still have things that they're doing to try to make this sustainable, which also I think is different from Mastodon, which is trying to go the completely like, please just donate enough money that we can run this forever, um, which I don't think is, is sustainable long-term either. And so, but the balance of like, one of them, we don't know if it'll have money to keep the lights on. The other one, we are afraid that's going to have too much money or or try to go after too much money to not make it a good place to be anymore. Or it gets bought by some other company, like, like someone else, some other billionaire could buy Blue Sky. But there is still the fact that you're using your own domain and you have more power over taking your stuff somewhere else, you know? The portable identity and portable data, I think, are the key parts of the app protocol. Yeah, it makes me want more to invest it because all the time I put into like LinkedIn and then it got weird. Now it has videos and I'm just like, uh, I don't know. And then, <laughs> you know, put so much time into Twitter and then made some of my best friends there. And now I'm just like, I put so much time into this and now it's just gone, you know? So the fact that blue sky, it's like, we know that we're going into it and we're making that investment, but at least we know we can take some of that investment with us if we have to leave one day. And again, I'm still, I still tell everyone like, go buy a domain, put your own website there first, like invest your time in your own domain, your own website, more than social media. Social media is convenient and it makes sense to like engage with people. But like, if you have, it's a different at interaction on social media, but yeah, well, like, and I, I don't like having interactions on my blog. Like I don't have comments. I don't have all that other stuff that like used to be there. Where everyone's like, oh, you can get likes on your, co on your blog post. I'm like, I don't want that. Like, I don't want people to come to my blog post and like it. Uh, I want to share it other places. And it's a different way to do like a one to many, like this is just me writing stuff over here. But when I engage with people and I share the link or I tell people about it over there, I want some, some interactions or I want to know what people think, but I don't want to know that directly on my site. I think that's having different control over the way that you interact with the world, right? Because it keeps your blog where it gets to be your voice. And it's not for engagement. It's not for likes. It's just a catalog. Except for when news media calls me. because I <laughs> You're ridiculous. You knew, you knew what you were doing when you wrote that. Okay. Like the whole time I was like, oh gosh, Justin, <laughs> like, I was having anxiety for you. <laughs> like, and then I was like, but yeah. I think it's good to have those separations because it keeps your voice honest. And I think it keeps you being able to like be your true self in a blog. Like all the blogs I've written are still on my computer and one day I'll release them. <laughs> That's a, a lot of people. Yeah. But I'll probably do it like on medium or like maybe on one of my sites or like through like Mills boss coders or another org. I think what a lot of people have this problem with too, I've, I've talked to plenty of people that are like, Hey, I want to start a website, but how will I know if it's successful? How will I know? How will I measure? It? I'm like, don't measure it. Please don't measure it. Like that is. I think I just want to do it for me. Yeah. No, if you're not doing it for you, then you're going to feel like a failure because you're like, oh, you know what? I didn't get a thousand views this week. So it must have sucked or that blog post didn't do well. I'm like, yeah, no. You know how many of my articles like did terrible and no one read them? Most of them. That's not my problem. <laughs> my problem is fighting DNS all the time. Like yeah. why, why is DNS <laughs> like this? Like. I did all this work this weekend and now I'm just like, I can't even see anything and I have to re like I have to fix whatever went wrong. I will say that GitHub's DNS are different than it go. Like if you go to like Cloudflare or Netlify or one of the other ones, it's yeah. This was supposed to be easier and I'm dying. And then I made it private and then went back to public. And now it's like, you broke it and I have to go figure out how. Oh, why? Yeah. Two more articles for me. One is ghosty. Ghosty. Ghosty, G-H-O-S-T-T-Y, uh, is a terminal from Mitchell Hashimoto uh, that he wrote a blog post recently. I've been using it. I've been part of the private beta for a little while um, because Mitchell's really nice. You're a part of every private beta. I'm a professional beta tester. Yeah. I, I love beta testing stuff, but I asked Mitchell cause I was getting a little fed up with my terminals that I was using and I knew he was writing this thing and he kept sharing it. And I was like, can I please, I joined his discord. I'm like, can I please get access. I want to, you have to build it from scratch today. Like if you're using it. <gasps> oh my gosh. Their themes are so pretty. The thing that I loved about this was his quote in his recent article about he's releasing a 1.0 in December for Ghosty. He's, it's been in private beta for, I think, over a year now. 
I've been using it as my main terminal for probably four or five months. Uh, but his goal says, he says, the goal with expanding terminal application functionality is to make text-based applications more attractive for developers to build and for users to use. I believe that text-based applications have a valuable niche in the software ecosystem, and I want to help modernize the platform. And I love that goal. I have been maintaining a GitHub repo called Awesome Tuis for like six years, seven years. And it has like a thousand applications that are all terminal based. They're all terminal interfaces. Um, I love TUIs. I think they're great and more performant than a GUI in many ways. And, and so I've just, I've been collecting them myself. And the fact that that's Mitchell's goal for making ghosty is, is just to make that ecosystem better and more vibrant. I am all here for it. For one, I love the moon Two, I love that it runs on Mac and Linux and like three, it's like, why do we always assume that just for it to be like technical or for it to be better, it always has to be like ugly and unexciting? <laughs> I love that this is command line, but you're making it more accessible to newer people and it's not ugly. And like his goal here is it's a native terminal, right? Because there's a lot of them that are like, if we want to make it pretty, we have to do something exotic and new and it looks foreign. And then it ends up biting you in the butt later yeah. because it's so different that when you're following a tutorial, something is now different for your terminal. So it doesn't fit here. You know what I mean? Like this just will yeah, make and a lot it... of the integrations into the operating system don't work. Like you don't get exactly. dock interactions and all that other stuff. It's like, no, this is a, a integrated native terminal for Mac and Linux. And it's, he wants it to be the best two week experience for those applications. And it's, it's not maybe as fast as some other ones, but it has more, uh, like escape characters than any of the other, like there were so many things that like, as I started using it, I came from another one that was like a small terminal called black box, which I really liked. And I don't use tabs and things in my terminal. Like I don't need all the features of the terminal because I use Tmux. And so I get everything that I usually want inside the terminal. And, and so it's like, I just wanted something that was compliant with so many different things in keyboard circuits. There's Tmux and Emux, Emacs. Like what is with all these, like everybody has their special sauce. I know. It's just, you get used to it. Like muscle memory is hard to, a hard thing to untrain. Right? Yeah. <laughs> uh, but we have been wanting, uh, Mitchell was going to come on the show uh, to talk about it. Um, also, he, you know, if, if you don't know Mitchell, he started HashiCorp. Um, the HashiCorp is going through some things. And, and so we were giving He's not part of HashiCorp anymore. He he did leave and he was doing uh, Ghosty as a personal project, which I completely respect him for like, yeah, I just want to go do this terminal thing for a little while, uh, which is awesome. So he'll he'll probably come on the show in the future. I want to talk to him after it gets released, but we are waiting for some other things on the business side uh, to wrap up. I'm looking forward to speaking with him. I also want to talk about his planes because he has a, he's a pilot. He has planes? Yeah, he he got his pilot's license years ago. And he if you follow him on Twitter, he's one of the ones I want to come over to Blue Sky because I love seeing his pictures of like, oh, he lives in LA too. So he's like flying into LA again. He has he bought a jet. Like he fully like, he just, he's like, well, I'm going to buy a jet now and fly across the country instead of like short trips. Uh, but he's been a pilot for a, a while now. That's wild. Yeah, really cool. The last article that I wanted to talk about is one I just read and it's from inc.com and it's the ultimate death of product management which i found interesting because it's all about how this ai overlap of like all these ceos are like i don't need a product manager i have ChatGPT, and i can ask it questions and i can get the insights i want which is a real thing that is happening in companies where they're like i don't need to talk to a person i can go do this thing uh the thing in the article that i thought was interesting was their definition for what a good product person is and this is more for product management, not project management. Project management is more about the task of getting things shipped. How do we make this thing go from nothing to something and get it out in the world? A product manager, uh, in their quote, was uh, she knows what people what the people want and how to bring it to them. It's someone that has a little more intuition about what their eventual customer would want and make them better productive. And I thought that was a better insight around what a product person does, especially as someone that like now I'm a product person and it's hard to define. <laughs> like, I don't, I don't know what I do. Uh, but I, I found the article interesting. I was just like, is AI killing off product management? And in many ways, I think, yes, at companies that had terrible product managers, it's like not saying the people were bad. It's more around the practice of empowering product managers to do, to have intuition and to experiment with things and to figure out what customers are going to want to have and how to bring it to them. A lot of companies don't let people do that, even if people have the intuition for it. And, and so now they're like, well, we can just go buy, 
off of historical trends, which is LLM training, and say like, oh, we can just do the thing that this thing tells me to do. Can we just talk about your spicy like takes? First it was cloud, then it was DevRel. Now you're going to have product spicy takes. I mean, I don't know. It's just, I like spicy food. We're going to have to put you <laughs> in like a bubble to like protect you from like the companies. I mean, like in a lot of cases, like I've, I've been doing these roles and it's, I have more spicy takes the longer I do them. <laughs> We've noticed. <laughs> I have more opinions after I get some more experience with it. You, I, I wanted to say too, you said you've been working on your, your GitHub universe talk and, and figuring out like how that affects. And that's why I was asking you about like empowering women in, in AI. And I think your insights there align with what I've now discovered from myself about what cloud native is, because I've, I've rethought, I, I wrote cloud native, the cloud native infrastructure book. I literally like went back and like read the definition while I'm working on this talk. Uh, I, I wrote the definition for the cloud native computing foundation, the CNCF. Like I wrote the original, what does cloud native mean? And I was like, I, looking at all that, I'm like, I was so wrong about all this. And I think the thing that actually is cloud native, if I look back at what people are actually doing, is paying your infrastructure people the same amount as your application developers. Because you give them equal footing at saying infrastructure is as important as applications. It needs a place to run. It needs to be scalable. It needs, and it aligns incentives. It gives, it empowers them to say no because historically, this is not the case. Like people are like, infrastructure was just a thing we had to do. It was just a thing that was like, oh, well, we got to ship the app, so we have to have someone to run a server, right? And cloud native changed that, and it did it through all these practices and patterns. And I don't think those are valuable necessarily. I think that the thing that makes a company cloud native is just putting those on equal footing and saying infrastructure is as important as this application. And I think in some ways what you're saying about empowering women is just like pay them equally. I don't think it's just payment. I think it's investment, right? Because payment seems it's just monetary, right? Like, well, like, but investment is part, like you'll invest in your application developer. You pay them $150,000, $200,000. You're going to get, send them the training. You're going to get them a book. You're going to, but I do think that it is more than paying them, right? Like, because you can pay somebody and money is like the people that say money doesn't matter. The lies because they, they aren't poor. Like, right. That's not true. (laughs) But it is investing in how your company runs, what your culture is like, what how people interact with each other, the training and meeting people where they're at. And like, okay, for instance, we both have children, right? Can you raise two of your children and treat them exactly the same? And will they both be successful? Like there's some things that some people are very good at. And there's some things that another person might still be great in that role, but they might not be. Have you ever read those articles about how they say women engineers are more the glue? And a lot of teams and they end up with more of gluey tasks, you know? Yeah, yeah. Like, and for a long time, like people were like, you're really good at processes and being technical, but we just want you to be technical. And you don't want to use somebody as like a note taker and your secretary, but also like, why aren't you appreciating them for the, how they can bridge the gap between being technical and the process? You know what I mean? Yeah. It's, it's a lot. It's not just money. It's about like... Finding what I think good management in any any role, any industry knows how to find people's strong suits and bring that out and help the, empower them to do their job, right? Everybody can, it's, you, you hit those qualifications for that job where you wouldn't be there, but how do you empower them to bring their their true self to that job and to use what they're good at to grow better? And I think some of that is putting them on equal, again, equal footing of like, like if, if, when I was a sysadmin and I went and talked to all the, the, the application developers and we went to a room and they said, we need this. And I said, I can't give that to you. They would say, leadership would tell me you have to figure it out because they make more money than you. And the money comes from that thing. And so like, I couldn't push back and I couldn't find the right role because it was just like, well, we think that applications are more important than infrastructure. And, and it didn't matter if I was like, if I was doing an infrastructure role, if I wanted to do a glue role, I feel like like DevOps in a lot of ways, raise the base pay for mm-hmm. a lot of sysadmins and by SRE. teaching them Git. But right, like, like, I, like it went progression, right? Because like, like this, you became a sysadmin, you went to DevOps because you learned Git. And then you went to SRE because you learned how to monitor something. And it's like your base pay went up because your value to the company went up. And now platform engineers are the application developers of infrastructure. And whether they're treated that way or not, but they get the highest pay of a lot of these infrastructure people. And they're like, oh, actually the 
the platform engineers should be able to say no. And they're empowered in the application teams to be like, I can give you this feature on our platform and you deliver the application this certain way. And they have a pushback because now the incentives are aligned and they say, hey, you both can do those things that are you're good at. And I think that in AI, there's a lot of this, like we only want the, the highly, highly detailed nerd person that understands this very specific esoteric thing because it's, they're trying to learn it and they're trying to discover what this even means to the world. And they don't know how that's going to affect the next team over or the product in the end goal. But they're also all the people that aren't that highly specific technical person, they're not paying them as much because that person has a PhD. And so they're going to demand more money versus the other person who's like, oh, well, I went to theater background, but I'm going to make you more money by improving the product before it gets to the customer. Also, I agree with you in a lot of ways. Don't take this as a disagreement because guess what? Money level is a playing field. Women might be more caretakers, but the more money that you have to outsource the things that you are now put on your plate, like if you can get a cleaning lady and you can pay more for daycare, you are leveling the the playing field. So don't get me wrong. I wholeheartedly agree with you, but say the infrastructure team needs more money to run better infrastructure to get better tools. That is an investment. The training's investment. So I agree with you. But just think that you have to like kind of really just the extras are important too, you know? No, yeah. And I, I think that you're right because the what a person is good at isn't always the same even on the same team, right? Like everyone wants a different focus. and It is not. You can be on two completely different like, you know, engineering teams and one team you can thrive in and one can be horrible. So it's like it just really depends. Yeah, but I think having having the company equally invest in you, no matter which thing you're doing, right? And if if everyone in the room makes a million dollars, who are you going to ask to take notes, mm -hmm. right? Like that's the like, hey, like we're all actually equal here because of that pay, because that's like the time reward that you like. That's what a job is. It's like you're trading your time for that money. Also, sometimes it's like toxically like. We don't want women taking notes. We don't want women to do the less technical tasks. But sometimes we need to do the people, the p engineering, like if chat GPT is writing so much of code and we're supposedly it's going to do so much of this, there is going to be a more of a need for people that can people and process and do technical because who is going to make sure that AI is doing the right things? Who's going to make sure the stakeholders and AI, like at some point, telling AI what to do is going to be like high level engineering because you are still breaking it down into tasks, right? You're still doing a process, right? So if all of these wonderful notions of big tech are true, you now need people that can people process and do technical even more than just the people that did technical, right? So instead of being like, oh, we won't make them take notes. When you find someone who can do all those three things, grow them. If they're in a really technical part that doesn't match their like where can you put them and grow them to be able to be the people that are the glue but the very well-paid glue who's appreciated <laughs> you know what i mean yeah and, and making making good engineers managers because they were good engineers kind of misses the point of like actually they're a bad thank you <laughs> when you actually like because communication <laughs> is a very like yeah. engineering is a team sport communication is really important being able to get everybody's buy-in for something is important but we down those skills because it's not a typical technical skill, but somebody could, who can have the deep technical understanding and still do those things are an asset in a different way. But we don't have that understanding for that. We only see engineering in one way. Instead of saying, you don't have to take notes, say, hey, we love that you can do all of these things and give them the people technical problems. You know what I mean? Yeah. I do find it funny. I'm not funny, but like kind of tragic that so many of the AI voices default to a female voice. Think about what you just said when you were reading that thing, when it said, uh, what was it? The, the product management, she is going yeah. to, <laughs> I oh, was no. like, Whoa. That's the, that's the we're question. especially getting rid of the women. <laughs> Like, well, no, like they're in that article, they're calling out like this was a person that was good at product that is doing product, and it was a woman, and it's just like people don't necessarily default to that, like oh, the quotes is she, and like, but the the fact that like all these like AI like bots are like taking the notes for us now, and they all default to a female voice, it's just kind of like oh, like that's not helping the stereotype. Of, like, Wait, also, and the one the fact that the one. 10x engineer AI was a dude named Devin, yeah. right? Yeah. Like <laughs> the fake one, too. Yes. <laughs> Completely BS his way into that job. <laughs> and it's so funny because it's like, 
we are almost hurting women more by being like, they have to only be technical and not take the notes and not do the other stuff. But like, is that truly what makes a good engineer is only coding? Because like, that's not even most of the job. Like, you know what I mean? They will lie to you all day before you're an engineer that all of the job is writing code. That's what I'm saying. So it's like, we've used those things that were meant to be intentionally good to be more toxic, <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> like y'all, that's not what we were trying to say. <laughs> like, so. Well, thank you everyone for listening to this episode. Uh, please give us feedback on this one. If you like us doing the news, I really enjoy just hanging out with Autumn and talking about stuff that we find interesting and sharing some of this with all of you. So if you want us to keep doing this, please reach out. Um, we are still in the changelog Slack, but I know that uh, there's been a lot more activity in uh, what's it called? Tulip? Is that what it's called? Zulip. Wait, there's a Zulip? Nobody told me. There's a Zulip thing. It's like a private, like I, it's interesting. Um, I'm not sold on it yet because it's kind of hard for me to stay intact or in touch with it because it doesn't have an app. And so it's like a web mm. portal on my phone. And like the way it threads things is interesting. I like that I can keep a conversation going for a long time, but also I forget context. I'm like, why did I get a reply to this thing from six months ago? So I'm there, but we, we will have shows that are in Zulip as well. Uh, but also it's in the changelog Slack. So I'm in Slack. I'm not in Tula Zulip. Right. And, but we're both on blue sky. So if you're, if you're joining and, and you want to say hi to either of us, uh, we'll have the links there too. Yes, please definitely write us on blue sky. Cause I feel like we'll see that and we'll see it quicker, you know, so we can respond and kind of like have better interactions with listeners. Yeah. So, uh, but again, thank you again for listening. If you have anyone that you want to have on the show, if you have topics that are, you're interested in, go ahead and email us. I don't think I've shared the email for a little while. A while. It's uh, ship it at changelog.com. Uh, Autumn and I both get the emails. We reply to all of them and it's great hearing from you of what you like and sometimes what you dislike and just really what you want us to talk about because I'm learning a lot of new things from hearing from all of you and I it's a lot of fun. Some of those emails give me the warm and fuzzies. They're so sweet and like I love like hearing about like just people and the people that like listen. Also, I had so much fun hanging out and just talking to you today. This was fun. It was like basically our phone calls, but like recorded. <laughs> yeah. So thanks everyone. Hope you have a great day. Have a good day. Thanks for listening to Ship It with Justin Garrison and Autumn Nash. If you haven't checked out our Changelog newsletter, do yourself a favor and head to changelog.com slash news. There you'll find 29 reasons, yes, 29 reasons why you should subscribe. I'll tell you reason number 17, you might actually start looking forward to Mondays. Sounds like somebody's got a case of the Mondays. 28 more reasons are waiting for you at changelog.com slash news. Thanks again to our partners at Fly.io. Over 3 million apps have launched on Fly, and you can too in 5 minutes or less. Learn more at Fly.io. And thanks, of course, to our Beat Freakin' residents. We couldn't bump the best beats in the biz without Breakmaster Cylinder. That's all for now, but come back next week when we continue discussing everything that happens after Git Push.